Welcome, everybody. It's so lovely to be here with you all tonight. Uh, I'm Alicia McBride, the Director of Quaker Leadership at FCNL. And tonight we're here for our October Quaker Changemaker event, Quakers Changing Government Past, Present, and Future with Marge Abbott and Katie Breslin. It's always exciting to be with you for these events where we invite friends to talk about how they're living their faith in the world and how that intersects with FCNL's advocacy. So I will introduce our speakers tonight and then we will um, center ourselves with a little bit of worship before I turn it over to them. Uh, so Marjorie Post Abbott has been traveling in the ministry, writing and facilitating workshops on the Religious Society of Friends for more than 20 years. She carries a concern for making friends' voices heard more widely in the world, which takes her regularly to Washington, D.C., where she has served as the presiding clerk of FCNL. And she is the author of this newly revised publication, which I don't know if my screen will let me show you, um, A Theological Perspective on Quaker Lobbying, published by the FCNL Education Fund. And Katie Breslin is a Quaker writer and advocate for peace and justice. She writes about issues related to religion, culture, and technology, and is currently a seminary student at Earlham School of Religion, where she is studying Quaker ministry. Before coming to seminary, Katie worked at FCNL and Catholics for Choice. At FCNL, Katie led the work of engaging young people to lobby Congress on peace and justice issues as the young adult program manager. She is a member of Friends Meeting of Washington and a sojourning member at West Richmond Friends Meeting. And she currently lives in Richmond, Indiana with her cat, Jada. So uh, before we get started, I wanna pass it over to Bobby Trice, uh, who's gonna run through some technical things for you. Thanks, Alicia. Hi, friends. I'm Bobby Trice, the Quaker Engagement Associate here at FCNL. And I'm running technology for tonight's event and will be managing the chat and such. I just wanted to highlight a few details for you. Um, as we're getting settled into the program, please feel free to send greetings using the chat function in Zoom. Just remember to address your message to all attendees and panelists to make sure that we can all receive your greetings. And um, we will have some time later on in the event to take questions from the audience via chat. So if you'd like to ask a question, please write it in the chat and include your name and where you're writing from. We'll answer as many questions as we can, time allowing, but we likely will not be able to answer them all. I think that's it for me. I'll turn it back to Alicia now. Thanks, Bobby. So we're gonna just start by settling for a, a minute or two of, of worship, and then we'll get started with our event. Thank you, friends. So I'm going to uh, turn things over to Katie, who is going to be uh, our host mostly for the evening, uh, who's going to be in conversation with Marge about uh, Quakers in government and, and the role that uh, friends have to play. So um, go ahead, Katie. Great. Thank you so much, Alicia and Bobby and everyone at FCNL that brought this conversation together. And for me, Marge, I'm so excited because I read uh, a theological perspective on Quaker lobbying when I was an FCNL staffer, and it informed so much of the work that I did at FCNL. So I'm so grateful that you updated it. This is exciting. So uh, Marge, can you tell us a little bit about, um, and I would highly recommend everyone go to the website. I don't have a physical copy of the pamphlet, but I have read it on the website. I would highly recommend checking it out. Um, 
a theological perspective or perspective on Quaker lobbying. But Marge, can you tell us a little bit about the spiritual underpinnings of advocacy and why you decided to write this pamphlet or update it, I should say? Thanks, Katie. It's good to see you. It's been fun to get to know you more. Um, and you know, one of the really distinctive things about Friends, and instead of handing down lots and lots of books of theology and abstract <laughs> discussions, we often transmit our faith by story, how people's lives are affected by their faith. So uh, these stories of faith and action are coming, a lot of them are come from Quaker journals. And so the, the whole um, reality, the two of the most important books in a Quaker library are the journal, in George, journal of George Fox and the Journal of John Woolman and many other journals rather than Barclay's theology. <laughs> that we, we are really focused on living out our faith. And the most striking feature of early friends for me is the strength of the vision that shaped their lives. And the words of the Gospel of Matthew, that chapter 22, laid out what I think is essential experience that underpinned their faith, this love of God and love of neighbor. And that love of neighbor stretches to include the enemy. They knew divine love in their own hearts and had no doubts that this love is available to all people. So this brought the res responsibility to treat all people with compassion as they learned to walk in the light. As Margaret Fell said, we are a people that follow after those things that make for peace, love, and unity. It is our desire that others' feet may walk the same. The, another key uh, biblical underpinning is from the prophet Micah and his admonishment to do justice, to love kindly, and to walk humbly with your God led, has led so many friends into this reality of speaking truth and plainness and singleness of heart. And then in this new creation, the poor and the vulnerable would be fed and the wealthy not honored more than the poor. So these friends um, in the first generation and over many generations since, many of them have seen themselves as what I call everyday prophets. And this prophetic voice in my mind is not about seeing, you know, foretelling the future. It's, that's not, and fortune telling kind of voice. That's not what the kind of prophecies we're talking about. But Bill Caber explained it in terms of a prophet is a person who can really listen deeply and can see beneath the surface of things and see through the chaos of, at this point, it's the political world around us. And in this, they can listen and learn to, to sort out the voice of the spirit from their own compulsions, their own worst self, and listen to that spirit that draws out the best in each of us and live in that. And then invite others to do the same. So there's always this invitation that's part of this. The light they found sometimes, but following the light was not always the best, easiest, gentlest thing because the light can make visible temptations and things you're doing wrong. But if you learn to listen deeply, pay attention to that guidance, there is always a way forward and a way to live in that light. But, I, mean, I can go on for, you know, I wrote a 600 page book on this. <laughs> <laughs> I, love your, <laughs> I love your work on everyday profits because I feel like that's a great um, word description phrase to describe uh, some of the people that I met when I worked at FCNL. Um, everyday prophets who brought their stories to Congress and really showed members of Congress what it's like to live in their districts and to face everyday problems um, and the ways that legislation really affects their lives. So it was really exciting to see that phrase because I think I, I use it more often now <laughs> because it just really captures, um, you know, that small 
role that every person can take to uh, really live into their faith and live into um, this world. So thank you for that. So Marge, can you talk a little bit about, you know, and we talked about this um, during our pre-conversation and Alicia actually pulled out a quote uh, from the pamphlet during our conversation and said, Quakers have been trying to influence government as long as there have been friends. <laughs> um, so can you talk a little bit about the history of friends speaking truth to governments and what is distinct about Quaker lobbyists and why we've been doing this? Okay, in terms of um, the history of friends, um, began in the mid 17th century, as I presume many of you know, and it was a time when it was certainly not easy or safe to call oneself a friend. To start with, um, there was a civil war in England that ended just as friends were getting started. Uh, there was a plague <laughs> that killed a lot of people. There was a, the city of London burned. You know, all these things going on in the background makes it sound sort of familiar to me. Um, and it was also a time when simply worshiping outside the state dominated church or ignoring social class distinctions uh, could end up throwing you in, with you ended up in prison. It was, you know, there were the legalities and restrictions on people's lives were so different from what we experience. It's sometimes hard to grasp. And um, Uh, putting, thinking about the Civil War and then it was in it, Cromwell and then uh, the monarch was restored to the thro English throne. But soon after this restoration of the English monarchy, there was um, a violent rebellion by who called themselves the Fifth Monarchist and got the um, English government rather on happy to say the least. And they started rounding up all the dissenters. And at the, soon, at, so soon after that, um, 4,000 Quakers roughly were uh, imprisoned in short order and put into these uh, filthy prisons, which were sometimes a death sentence just to be there. And parliament then passed what was known as the Quaker Act, which made it illegal to refuse to take an oath of loyalty to the government and specifically was forbidding Quakers to assemble under the pretense of joining worship. And this, they were um, banned from, uh, <laughs> I'm getting my words, banned <laughs> because they were banned from worshiping together on the threat of banishment from England. <laughs> it was their punishment. So. Um, but the preface to the act, the Quaker Act read as follows. The said persons under a pretense of religious worship do often assemble themselves in great numbers in several parts of this realm to the great endangering of the public peace and safety and to the terror of the people. And it just blows my mind to take that sentence and apply it to thinking of sitting in the silence and waiting for divine guidance. But this persecution, far from silencing friends, caused them to be ever more intent to argue their case with parliament and on the public street corners. They just continued to challenge many of the social and religious norms of their day. Many of the, um, many friends, um, some of whom had actually fought in the civil war were really disillusioned by the Civil War and um, came to reject violence as a way to make real change in the society. As a result, many leading friends came to make public statements unequivocally opposed to taking up arms. Uh, and this, the peace testimony, as we know it, started to, to really emerge as important. And one way George Fox described this peace testimony is to say that the spirit of Christ, which leads us to all truth, will never move us to fight and war against any man with outward weapons, neither for the kingdom of Christ nor for the kingdom of this world. However, friends were 
uh, not shy about defending their practices with words. And so you have things like Margaret Fell's Women of Speaking Justified, which remains in print today, people still refer to it. And other pamphlets were aimed at gaining public support to end the persecutions and to separate out friends from the more violent dissent, dissenting groups, as well as for actively lobbying for members of the parliament to repeal these things like the unjust laws like the Quaker law and to release friends from prison. There's obviously lots more that can be said here, but I just wanna simply note that seeking to influence legislation and change in the course of the nation has been an essential dimension for a Quaker work in the world from the very first days when they had to defend their very existence up and through, through the period, the several, de what, seven decades or so that they governed the state of Pennsylvania. So they had actual governance experience and on into the modern day, that is still obviously very important. And this is all work that might arise from individual leadings. It might be work of a decision of a monthly meeting or a yearly meeting. And Quakers along the way formed lots of committees, be it Friends Committee on National Legislation, legislation or committees to uh, work with Native Americans or lots and lots of committees. We got, got that down, <laughs> right? We're very good at committees now. <laughs> yeah, and just a whole range of issues, work with Native Americans, um, universal suffrage, obviously abolition, uh, helping to establish the United Nations. They're just, and just you can go on and on and on and on with the various things that friends were looking at, really making our nation fit more closely to their vision of what the world might be, it might be called the new creation. Yeah, I love that. And I'm glad that you mentioned specifically Margaret Fell's uh, Women Speaking Justified, because when I read that for the first time in seminary, I was just completely blown away to hear her words and to see even the places where <laughs> I feel like women's voices are still being uh, trying to be added to the conversation. So it's, yeah. it, I, I understand why it's still uh, in print <laughs> now, mm -hmm. because it does feel very relevant. And, you know, and a lot of these other early friend texts that um, we still read. So Marge, can you speak a little bit about, you know, we, FCNL has been around um, since, you know, from, from uh, you know, the 40s. And, uh, you know, we've had Quaker lobbyists, people that have been talking to government, like you said, this history of friends. But what do you think is it that um, makes Quaker lobbying distinct? Like, what do you think... Um, you know, the role FCNL and the people that are involved with Quaker lobbying, what makes their ministry so powerful? Well, I, I'm sure I think you've, we've talked about a little bit that I, one of the things this last six months or so when I was supposed to be the friend in Washington, became friend not in Washington, but I've been working on putting together a pamphlet just and trying to answer that particular question. And as in this process, interviewed many FCNL staff and volunteers. I'm just gonna touch on little bits of what is part of that. But certainly essential to this role is this sense that individuals who lobby on behalf of friends are not out there seeking fa favors like so many people are doing <laughs> in their lobbying. And um, as one person said this, as they go out to um, do this lobby work and look at their um, experience, that being a Quaker lobbyist helps, this one person said, helps me live out my deepest values, which is very different from what I think about as lobbying. So one of the roles of a Quaker lobby is, is, is to call on others, including members of Congress, to bring a moral grounding to their role as government role in governance and to recognize that people cannot be treated as just uh, votes in a column or means to an end. So as part of this, a Quaker lobbyist must learn to listen with care as well as speaking to an issue with well-researched facts or true stories on the effects of constituents. FCNL's 
become well known on Capitol Hill. And, you know, war is not the answer. Love by neighbor, no exceptions. This, these appear on lawn signs around the city as well as around the country. Uh, so congressional offices are pretty familiar with FCNL because it's been around so long and established a very visible presence, especially with these different uh, bumper stickers and lawn signs and everything. But also want to recognize that in some cases, it's actually the Quaker schools that have opened up doors for FCNL. So there's a noticeable number of congressional aides that um, are happy to meet with the FCNL because they went to a Quaker school and that experience left them with a really uh, a real abiding respect for Quakers. Diana Oldon, uh, one of the senior FCNL uh, strategists, gave me this uh, story, which I love. She says, I love saying that I am a Quaker peace lobbyist. This blows people's minds. They seem like the three words that don't belong together. Quaker, isn't that a brand of oats? Peace, you mean that there's really somebody lobbying you for peace? Lobbyist? I thought lobbyists were bad. <laughs> this makes a great start to a discussion, she reports, and people really brighten up once they hear the explanation. I love that as a starting point. Um, so by not assuming differences are irre irreconcilable and listening with respect, um, find sometimes surprising open means can and opportunities for relationship can be developed. There's one young Quaker with long hair and a beard and so he went to the office of a very conservative member of Congress and the staff member he was talking to made it very clear he had been a Marine. But the response was to ask him about his experience and question him. And next thing they knew, they were starting to talk about uh, the Persian Gulf War and what was going on. And the Marine, former Marine was there with agreed totally about how politicians too easily made international threats and deployed troops. And next thing you know, this, uh, aid was happy to inform his boss about what the Quakers were asking. I love those stories and they feel so similar. You know, I spent my time at FCNL training young people in particular how to lobby Congress and to see them speaking their truths to Congress. And I shared a story with you during our conversation uh, that I'd love to share, which is uh, we had a young person come in from Alaska to uh, lobby the ACA during um, the uh, the summer of 2017 or 20 oh wow the summers go together 2017 <laughs> it's you know it's it's wild and um and when she told her story the staffer said uh, I'm so grateful that you didn't just yell statistics at me you told me exactly how this bill has affected you in Alaska and that is the most meaningful part of this. And I, I think about all those times that people have um, shared their stories to Congress and it's really humanized the legislation and really, you know, been important ministry for Congress. So thank you for, for highlighting that. And so looking at our world today, uh, you know, friends uh, and early friends felt like it was apocalyptic, you know, it's not far feeling from apocalyptic now. Um, but looking at where we are, Marge, uh, where are we, what are the lessons do you think that we can learn from our history? Um, and what does that offer us going forward um, in doing this important work of lobbying? Well, I, I grew up among friends and um, as a teen, I was really excited about the history of friends and their role in lots of formative actions in American history. But my uh, favorite person, that's Maybe she's got a, maybe still is my favorite person is Lucretia Mott. And her courage and her imagination and deep faith and her perseverance uh, all just really speak to me. 
we and I know we, we live in a decade that um, we're looking back at our history and everyone, you know, all of us, friends and non-friends alike, because um, bringing forth dimensions long ignored, such as the fact that so many American heroes, from George Washington to William Penn and many forward others, uh, were enslaved, enslaved pe had enslaved people working for them. And Lucretia is one of those whose reputation has withstood such scrutiny. She spent most of her life advocating against slaveholding. And at the same time, she reached out to blacks as equals and reported things like having been chastised for walking down the streets of Philadelphia chatting and even holding hands with the black women who were her friends. That, and she also understood a lot about the um, interaction of use, of use of slave made goods and need for restrictions on those kinds of things. So she offers a very different look at um, how we might be challenged to break through the blinders of our own culture. And one of the most important lessons though she taught me came from her perseverance. Because she was such a public figure and implicitly challenged the friends in her meeting for their lack of commitment. She was often at odds with her own religious community. And helped me by reminding me that in every community, even one that's dear to me and seeking to be faithful, there are going to be disagreements and people are going to come in with very different approaches and it can be painfully hard to bring about lasting significant change. And when you look at somebody like Mott, some of her community felt they had done enough simply by ending slavery among friends. Others wanted to work together to change American law. Yet um, others end up uh, fighting in the Civil War and created the, in this face of the tension between the peace testimony and, you know, conviction not to fight and this need to end this horrible institution of slavery. And she often found it heartbreaking, the differences. And um, the fact that she could stay, stay the course through a very, very long life and, um, and face through uh, threats, you know, literal threats. She was, I know one time she was chased by a mob <laughs> down the streets of Philadelphia. Uh, not a very friendly mob. Uh, <laughs> it be really hard, but just as hard can be those changes of small things with your everyday life. And they're all part of it that we are learning again and again and again. So in this century, we certainly have come to face to face with our own differences as friends over issues relating to gender and sexuality, and now about re-examining the role of police in our communities and racism as it pervades all aspects of our culture. And um, hanging in there, persevering. Yeah, I, I really appreciate, you know, when I was reading and learning more about Quaker history, just the times when friends really nailed it and the times where we were really, really wrong. And I think acknowledging <laughs> that history of, of the times that we were wrong um, is really important so that we can learn. And a lot of that comes from, you know, just a recommitment to listening and accompaniment of especially communities who are experiencing, you know, such as things like police brutality or just police presence often in communities um, or, you know, other major issues. Um, I think it's really important for us as friends to be accompaniments and, and to really lift those voices up to make sure that uh, Congress is hearing exactly what's happening in these communities. That's really important. So how exciting. We, oh, do you and, and this is all brings us back to the you know, some, that central ideas of uh, Micah 8, where, mm -hmm. you know, to do kindness, to, to love kindness and do justice, but also to walk humbly with God and that sense of humility and listening and learning. Absolutely. A big, big piece here. But I think that would be the essential lesson I would lay raise up. 
Yeah, I love the the work that you did, um, uh, Micah, in, in the pamphlet. I really appreciate that. So let's see what other people are asking questions. I got to ask all of my burning questions to you, Marge. And so let me look in the chat here. We got one question. Uh, what most excites about, what is the most exciting thing about the role of FCNL and the Quaker tradition of speaking truth to power in this specific time period in our history as a nation? As an educator at Friends Schools, what would you want me to share with my students? So thinking about what is the most exciting part of FCNL at this time period and and specifically, you know, a lot of the work that you're seeing FCNL doing, you know, since you've been, you did the pamphlet, you wrote the pamphlet a few years ago, and now FCNL is a very different organization <laughs> in a lot of ways. Um, so, so tell us a little more about that. I mean, one of the things that uh, I've been really excited about is, is that change in FCNL. You know, when I started out, there were times when I think there were maybe 16 people on staff, and <laughs> well, I'm older, grayer people around. Um, <laughs> you still see some of that with the uh, general, maybe a lot of us are older, but it's been built into FCNL at this point that um, between the advocacy teams and the interns and, you know, the, anyway, the, all the young people that have been brought into the staff, and now there's a staff of over 50, and it's much, 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 much younger than it's been, and it's much more diverse. And they're asking hard questions and pushing um, FCNL to really understand our country in a different way and under perhaps understand the role in a different way. I'm not close enough to know all of that, but that's the sense that I've picked up. And so the, the, this is one of the things that really gives me hope. Yeah, you know, I um, there was a, a young adult who um, was named Mimosa Thomas. Uh, she's an advocacy core person who actually recently passed away, unfortunately, at a young age. Um, and I'll never forget um, when she shared, she like asked the really tough questions, you know, and I think that that is a really important part of accountability is making sure that, you know, in speaking plainly, we're also speaking our truth and we're also speaking directly and asking, you know, asking, there's a level of intimacy that comes with a relationship when you're willing to ask direct questions. Um, and I always saw that through her and I always think about her when we were talking about, um, you know, this idea of, of Quaker lobbying. What does it mean to be a Quaker lobbyist? Uh, so I, I really appreciate that. Thank you, Marge. Um, so we have a question from another friend. Can you suggest some terms to describe Quaker advocacy besides faith-based? It seems that the emphasis we put on listening gives our advocacy a different flavor that isn't quite accompanied by um, faith-based. So what are some of the other ways that you would um, describe our lobbying uh, in, in this work? Um, I think, you know, there's a really deep concern for justice. Mm, yeah. And um, and I think that that is one piece that, you know, that justice and equality, when you look at, you know, and you can, you know, there's the Quaker uh, little uh, spice rack, mm -hmm. as some people call it in terms of simplicity, integrity, mm -hmm. <laughs> community. Uh, <laughs> equality mm -hmm. and sustainability, so, or yeah, sustainability. But it, but it, I mean, but this the ways, different ways that we figure how to uh, remind ourselves how we might live in the world differently mm -hmm. that makes the world a better place for all of us. Mm -hmm. And I think this kind of vision that FCNL holds. It can be described in as much more secular terms as well as in the faith-based terms. And um, my, my love is it and experiences in that faith-based side of things. But, I, but actually the very first 20 years that I was an activist, I was very much a secular activist out there, you know, marching against the Vietnam War and working to get the ERA passed and all that kind of stuff. But and it was only much later that it came to really saw the difference that it made to me in my life mm. to 
rely on that faith-based piece and that keep listening to God. He gave me the courage to do some things that I wouldn't have otherwise. Absolutely. So. Yeah, I love um, that you brought in the testimonies for that because when I often think about the testimonies, um, the testimonies are supposed to be the results of the ways that we live our life as opposed to the values that we live on, right? And And so if we're, you know, listening to that of God and each person and, you know, all of these other incredibly important uh, morals and beliefs, um, then that is the result of our actions should be that we should be acting peacefully and with integrity and, you know, in a community oriented way. Um, so I think that that's, thank you for bringing that element into this, because I think that's really important. And right, I think well. it comes in different, in different people's lives. You come at it from different directions. Absolutely. Yeah, we were sharing how I, I found Quakers, you know, a little bit differently uh, than you did. I found Quakers by working for Quakers. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, um, and so it's a it's a different world. But, you know, it's been really a beautiful journey, I think, for both of us to like learn our Quakerism connected with our spiritual leanings to do advocacy work. It's been great. So um, we have another question. Is the FCNL office just across the street from the federal building so that the slogan can be hung out the windows for senators and Congress people to see? And I think the answer is yes. You know, I haven't been to the FCNL <laughs> office. <laughs> um, but Marge, you were supposed to be a friend in Washington, um, you know, and uh, you've been to DC in the office uh, so many times. Do you think that the location of the FCNL office um, gave a unique advantage um, to people to be able to do that lobbying and um, neighborhood work? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, you can see it just in the fact that you can go and have a meeting with the Senator, you know, by walking across the street. You don't have to drive <laughs> across town and find a parking place, or, <laughs> you know, all of those kinds of things. So just even on that most basic uh, piece, mm. that's very helpful. But FCNL also has been very conscious of using its space um, in ways similar to the Quaker, way the Quaker UN office in New York is, and in Geneva are used in terms of bringing together people who maybe don't want to be seen together. Mm. Um, so you might have two members of Congress that are in different parties and different perspectives and they can come together and meet in say the Welcome Center now. And it's we're convenient enough that it makes sense for them to come there and they can have private discussions without worrying and looking over their shoulder about who's watching them. <laughs> kind of think I don't know whether that's a fair dis description, but <laughs> it, it's a, that sense yeah. that that space, but also just things like when I was there when they were um, rebuilt the op main office building, the FCNL office building that's across from the Hart mm. Senate building. And once that was built, it was, there was just person after person, senator and representative and architect of the Capitol and all kinds of folks coming to see that building because it was the first green building on Capitol Hill. That's so cool. And people were starting to hear about, oh, well, you gotta pay attention to green buildings. And, well. and I think Joe Volk, who was general secretary at the time, and I think he mainly became a tour guide. It sounds like the way he was describing the number of people that came through that building. And it got folks like the architect in the Capitol who is responsible for setting the criteria for a lot of federal construction, get him to think, hey, we can do this green building and it's not gonna destroy us financially. And you know, the, the good things might come out of it. And so that became an integral piece the lobbying in a way it couldn't couldn't be if it had been anywhere else in Washington. Absolutely. Uh, when I was an FCNL staffer, I spent a lot of time hiding in the Quaker Welcome Center because it's just so comfortable. And then sometimes I would get the, the lobbies be like, all right, we need this space. And I'm like, all right, <laughs> your quiet <laughs> conversation is really important. So I, I will I will remove myself from these very comfortable chairs uh, for, for for the, you know, for our democracy. Um, and actually Diane Randall uh, commented in the chat uh, to us that the message outside the building right now is just the words vote. So hopefully it's not only the, you know, the 
senators or representatives who are hopefully voting on, you know, a COVID stimulus package or whatever else FCNL is advocating for, but also a good reminder for us to uh, vote this election, <laughs> which is really important, um, and vote early, which is also yeah, and really your, important. And your garden, garden solves, offers some of that kind of same benefit. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know, they could be just um, tourists coming by. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I that, yeah. I mean, lunch or whatever. Yeah, it was, um, I, my desk was like, right next to, um, would look out and I would just see people just like staring up at the building, um, the words about the answer signs, just kind of with curiosity. And I think that that is a part of public ministry for FCNL. And just that, you know, it's, we have so many messages that say things like, you know, that just, oh, we have to go to war or we, you know, um, I hate this person. Like, and just to see a sign that says war is not the answer was just, you know, a, a, in the sea of all these other things just felt like, you know, a, a beacon of resistance in, in the middle of a tourist area. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. I always really appreciated that. Um, and they have very comfortable benches outside too. So all of those is, is very lovely. So another question we got, Marge, is um, as a long-term activist, what from your experiences can you provide for educators and their students as a way forward? So uh, thinking about, you know, uh, we've been, you, were, you were working in the Vietnam War uh, advocacy and you kind of been doing this for a long time. So what are some of the ways that you stay resilient um, and what are some of the advice that you might have for providing um, this continued path forward to doing this advocacy work? Well, um, I really believe right now we're at a time where absolutely it's going to be even more essential after the election than now to be prepared to to lobby and to speak up and to speak up from this place of faith. And there's so much fear that is just in the air everywhere, and it's being uh, nurtured by people in power. And we cannot lose sight of that fact that the only real counter to fear is love. And too many people just threaten violence as their answer to whatever they declare is wrong. So offering alternatives to those kind of common cultural norms, I guess, of that come down to greed and power and all those kinds of good things as dominant. The, our voice, I think, is needed more than ever. And I think one of the biggest challenge is for the future, for the coming years, is how to reestablish trust in the federal government and to a lesser degree in the states and local governments. But right now, the trust level of our government is really bad. Um, I do have this optimistic street to hope that what friends have is enough presence in the halls of Congress and in the nonprofit community and other venues to offer examples of how to build trust by building relationships and by really stressing integrity and all these other dynamics that are really important. Um, and even if there's a sweeping change in national policy uh, you know, who the president is in Congress, the new uh, government's going to need all the help it can get. <laughs> this is not going to instantaneously solve things. And so it's going to be really important to highlight positive steps that Congress takes and um, demonstrate popular support for efforts for key changes and admonish people when they... Um, do things with, that we really disagree with and prod them to change. And keep reminding them that it's uh, their responsibility to the people of our nation and to look for the, out for all of us and not just for the privileged few. So I think this um, willingness to step forward and why I mobilize a wide variety of voices, which FCNL can do with all its lot, uh, working with allies. And uh, it seems like any kind of, uh, there's a huge number of uh, lobbying groups, nonprofit lobbying groups of coalitions 
that are chaired by FCL staff, it seems that every time I turn around, it turns, and somebody talks about, well, somebody from my FCNL staff is chairing that one, and they're chairing that one. <laughs> so being out there and keeping this in front of Congress, this kind of, this whole vision of the world in front of Congress, I think is, re and much wider than that too, of course, but, um, I think this, that's so we got quite a task in front of us for the next who knows how many years. Yeah, I think the what it resonated with me most, um, and one of the things that convinced me of becoming a friend is this um, emphasis on dreaming of a world that is different than our own, that is our current existence, you know, the world we seek. I, I rattled off the we seek so often when I was on the FCNL staff and sometimes would just read them and be like, I want to seek a world free of war and the threat of war. <laughs> like, I want to live in that world and and having steps towards that world and recognizing that we, we live in, in this beautiful ecosystem of activism where lots of people are finding their their path and their way and their voice to advocate for change. I think it's really beautiful to be in this time where so many different people are finding the natural ways that they, you know, can advocate for themselves and to be part of the change in our society. So that's been really exciting to see how many people are getting involved in lots of, you know, maybe it is an FCNL, but you know, like in lots of different ways. Um, and that's, that's really exciting. And, but it always, you know, when I worked at FCNL, it was great to hear people say like, I, you know, I feel really good and at home when I'm lobbying Congress because this is where my skill set is and this is how I can create change. And that's always really exciting to find that fit of where you fit into the social change environment is really exciting. That's great. So let's see. Oh, and I, I, another correction. Um, so Diane uh, said that the whole sign says, vote our democracy depends on it. <laughs> so uh, a much, much more important message than I, you know, it's a very long way to go, but uh, let's see if we have one more question for the audience and then I, um, I'm gonna take the opportunity to have the last question. Uh, so a friend asked specifically about um, how can social workers collaborate with FCNL and in particular with Alaskan indigenous communities? But can you talk a little bit more broadly about um, that, you know, social workers, but also more broadly about um, how, do, uh, how do you think people's unique experiences in their jobs or in their role in society, how do you think that that connects with Congress um, in the ways that we live in our world? Like how are some of the ways that you think that our personal experiences can help um, push forward a, a more just um, legislative agenda for Congress? I think it's, it's a lot of it is that what you just said, the bringing forth these stories that people can tell vividly, speak vividly of what life is like in their communities. And if you take away the SNAP program, they're going to be, you know, these 10 kids over here that are not going to get food, you know, what, or whatever it may be, that the folk that bringing that piece of the truth, that's the reality of how, in the case of lobbying, how the constituents of any given congressman are living, and when, and being able to articulate uh, what the effect of particular pieces of legislation are gonna be on their community. It touches something different, you know, and, and I think we also respond to stories and uh, gets us away from all the statistics and statistics and statistics. And while I, I know it really, can be really essential at times to have, to have that knowledge of, of those statistics because that one person could be the only one that you're talking to telling your story is the only person that's affected in that particular way and it can't be generalized. But <laughs> that, that um, recognition that we each bring our, you know, our humanity and our joys and our struggles and make that visible. Yeah, and I love, uh, earlier you talked a little bit about 
um, all the coalitions that FCNL staff were on. And I felt like when I was there, there's constantly, you know, oh, I have to go, I have to be on a coalition call. <laughs> um, and I love that, you know, that idea of, um, you know, friends, the lobbyists uh, really do um, have a lot of uh, agency when it comes to looking at legislation um, and looking at different um, pieces to, to advocate for and really to help shape where you know the network of advocates puts their lobbying efforts um, and I love that because I mean it means that you know our um, person that's working on indigenous rights um, is actually working with indigenous communities to, to understand where that legislation and how um, how how that will be affecting by those communities or our person that's working on criminal justice reform is working with, you know, different other faith-based organizations that are working on criminal justice reform that have different ways of um, connecting uh, with this issue. So I think it's really exciting to see people who are willing to use their experience and their stories to bring forward um, that, that, you know, that important message to Congress. So I get the last question, <laughs> um, and this is a hard one. So Marge, uh, be prepared. Um, I'm sorry. So, uh, <laughs> so you know, given the political climate of today, why is it worthwhile to lobby and advocate uh, for peace from a, a you know from an FCNL perspective? Uh, you know, you and I are as Quakers from a place of faith in this present moment. How could we not? Um... <laughs> How can we not say that there is another way to live with our fellow human beings? There's another way to live with all life on this planet. And if we don't pay attention to some of these other ways of living in the dominant reflexive uh, approach to Conf you know, conflict, which tends to be direct and uh, power-based, we're giving up the ground. Um, <laughs> we're letting go of any hope of the world being what it might be. And um, I'm not sure what I can hear. Yeah, I think it's such a big question and such a I know. I've been thinking when we I've been thinking about this question a lot, you know, um, as a seminary student, you know, someone who is outside I lived in DC for 10 years and now I live in Indiana, which I love. Everyone should be a Hoosier. Um, but I've been thinking a lot about this idea of what does it mean to speak truth to power? I don't I think as um, as people, you know, we shouldn't be afraid of conflict, but part of conflict is for us to actually name what we desire, is actually to say what is our vision for the world. Um, so I think that that's what kind of what you're saying here too, is that, you know, in order to have the world that we would like to see, we have to actually advocate for it. So get out there Very and lobby. So. <laughs> absolutely critical. That, that <laughs> seems like a good place to wrap up. Thank you, <laughs> Katie, for uh, your on message closing. <laughs> um, and thank you both to Katie and Marge. This has been a really uh, wonderful conversation to listen to and, and um, help shape uh, to the extent that, that I was involved in that. And um, I, I, I think Bobby shared earlier the, uh, the link to the Theological Perspectives uh, book on our website that you can um, get, a, get a copy of that and uh, sort of see where the inspiration uh, for, for this came from. And, um, and I know several of you asked questions that we weren't able to get to, and, and we will um, do our best to follow up on, on any conversations that, that we, uh, we weren't able to have tonight um, at the closing. But uh, as, as we're wrapping up, I just wanna turn it back over to Bobby, who can, who's just gonna give a, a quick overview of where you can find the Theological Perspectives booklet if you want to get your own copy. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Alicia. I'm gonna just share my screen really quickly and show you where you can um, download or request your own copies of Marge's pamphlet on our website. All right, so 
I start with just my uh, Google browser here, but I am going to type in a short link here, fcnl.org slash Quaker lobbying. And that'll take me to um, the landing page for Marge's new resource. And uh, you can either download a free digital copy of the PDF or you can request physical copies. Um, and we really hope that you will and share this wonderful updated resource with your meeting, your church, your community, your school, anyone who may be interested and find value in uh, the theological basis of Quaker lobbying and a lot of the points that we've touched on during this conversation. And then I also just wanted to um, forecast some uh, upcoming events. If you go to fcnl.org slash events, you can uh, find all of our listings for um, our exciting virtual programs that are coming up. So um, first, I, I actually just wanted to say that we do have our annual meeting in Quaker Public Policy Institute coming up in November. We would uh, love for you to come join us for that and uh, lobby for the Justice and Policing Act. Uh, we also will have a few opportunities after the election um, to share and worship with friends and to uh, tune into our next Thursdays with Friends event, which will be on the election, um, featuring Diane Randall and uh, an election expert. So we hope that you will uh, go to fcnl.org slash events and check out what great opportunities we have coming up and register to tune into a few of them. All right, I think that that is it for me. Uh, thank you all so much. Thank you again, Marge. Thank you again, Katie. And thank you all out there in the audience for participating with such energy, asking really great questions. Um, this was such a great event. I'm really happy to be a part of it. Thanks so much. Thank you, and, uh, thank you Bobby. Thanks for putting this together. <laughs> absolutely. Looking forward to the next one. Yeah. It's great to work with you, Katie. I hope our paths cross again. Thank you so much. Yes.